Hello, good morning, students. Hi, hi. I hope you are all awake. Okay, I hope the whole class is here now. Um, I hope you had a good night's sleep. Okay, so today I have an interesting lesson to share with you, which is on microorganisms and viruses. Okay, so <clears throat> it is just five groups of organisms, microorganisms that you need to learn. And uh, what you need to remember are the characteristics and why we group them into certain groups. Okay, now, for uh, first of all, can you please uh, give me a feedback on whether you're able to hear me? Good morning, Ke Yi. <clears throat> can you hear me, Ke Yi? Am I loud and clear? Is there anything wrong with my mic or my speaker? Uh, yeah, or my, my, I mean, my, my audio. <clears throat> okay, uh, anyone? Yeah, okay, good morning, everyone. Hazel, Josephine, Tiffany, Xin Hui, Jiao Wei, you mean... Okay, good morning, girls. All right, we've had two weeks of holidays, so it's back to work now. Uh, okay, I hope full steam ahead. Mm, okay, Yun Ning. All right, Yan Li, good morning. Yin Min. Okay, you can hear me. Yeah, uh? everyone can see the yes there. All right, okay, so I shall share, uh, share screen. All right, okay. Okay, so you can look at your textbook and hear my additional uh, notes for you here. Okay, All right, every morning, everyone. Okay, so let me have a look. Sorry, I think I clicked on something here. Yeah, all right. So microorganism and viruses. First of all, let's look at the definition of microorganisms. Okay, good morning, Jenny, Minyin, Tiffany, everyone. What is the definition of microorganisms? So in your textbook, it will correlate to here. Okay, so but I find well, the points here a little bit lacking. Okay, so I want you to give, uh, I want to give you a better picture of uh, what you're supposed to learn. So that's why I'm adding some additional notes for here. So here, <clears throat> here you can see the structure here. There are five groups here. Okay, so it's nothing different. I'm following the textbook, but I've given you some additional points here. All right, first of all, what is the definition of microorganisms? Okay, as, as you know, the word micro, uh, micro means small. Organisms means living things. So microorganisms, uh, uh, we call it our short form, we call it microbes. Uh. Microbe is, is actually the same meaning. It's a real uh, short form, uh, colloquial. Uh. They, are, they are microscopic organisms. The definition here is they cannot be seen with the naked eye. That means they are so small that if you were to use your own eye just without any device, without any visual device, you will find it very difficult to see them. In fact, some of them you can't even see. You might be able to see them as in specks, very little small dots, okay? Uh, like, for example, algae, certain algae like amoeba, paramecium, you can still see them actually. It's just one small little dot, you know, in, a, in, in, the, in the water or whatever, but you can't really make up the details, okay? So they cannot be seen with a naked eye. Naked eye means using your uh, <clears throat> existing eyes, I mean, your, your vision, without any help of any visual aid. Visual aid, by, uh, what I mean is by magnifying glass or uh, the microscope. Okay, uh, so it has to be uh, seen only with the help of a visual aid. Okay, now most microorganisms are unicellular. Okay, I'm not saying all, uh, so most only. But there are some actually uh, happen to be multicellular. For example, like spirogyra. So you have a string of cells which are interconnected and you get a form long filament. Okay, so they're all around us and they affect our lives. Okay, in many ways. So let's uh, first of all look at the five groups. Okay, how do you remember the five groups? Okay, so I would like to introduce to you. Uh, first of all, you have bacteria. Okay, you have a protozoa. So bacteria, protozoa, right? Then you have algae, fungi, and virus. Okay, so I want to tell you how to remember. Maybe this is one, one suggestion. Uh, okay, you may have other ways of remembering the five groups. So if you do not have any other way of remembering it, right, okay. Just looking at your comments, huh? anyone has any comments or any new input, I'll just look through that. Okay, so B, B, P, A, V, F. So one way to remember is to make a sentence. So this is what we call acronyms. Acronym is using the first letter and you make up a sentence. Okay, so I would like to you know, maybe put it in a sentence, all right? Okay, B for biology. Okay, B for physics. Okay, I don't know how many of you like physics. <laughs> okay, A for N or oh, R, R, sorry, R. V for very. Uh, what do you think I'm going to put there? <laughs> Biology and physics are very what? 
very frustrating. <laughs> Maybe you want to put frustrating or you can put fascinating. For me, it's fascinating. That's why I'm, 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 I'm in teaching bio, okay? Because I find it very fascinating. Okay, but you, even if it doesn't, it's not fascinating for you, you can say frustrating, okay? It's up to you, as long as you remember. The most important thing is you're able to remember the whole, what you want to remember, which is but B for bacteria, P for protozoa, A for algae, V for virus, and F for fungus, a fungus or fungi, okay? So fungus is also interchangeable. Fungus is just singular, that means one. Okay, if you have more, you say fungi, okay? So you can use this or you can make you want to devise your own. You can make your own. Doesn't matter, all right? Sometimes it's the more uh, funny it is, the more ludicrous it is, it is even more easier to remember, okay? It's up to you, all right? Okay, fun, okay, good. The way you consider it's fun, yes. It can be fun. You know, you have to have an open mind to a lot of things, all right? A lot of things can be fun if you give it a chance to be fun and change your attitude, all right? Okay, so biology and physics are very fascinating. Biology and physics are very fun, okay? Now, let's look at bacteria, all right? Bacteria <clears throat> is one of the smallest of the five groups here, but it's not the smallest, okay? The smallest has to be the virus. Virus, you really, really need an electron microscope to see it. With a normal microscope, you're not able to actually make up anything at all. Not to say you can't make up the details, you can't even see at all. Okay, bacteria. Let's look at the facts first. Huh? So they are unicellular. They are, can only be seen under microscope at high power. So even though we say you're unicellular, they exist in its own uh, as one cell, right? But they sometimes they can live together in what we call colonies. Colonies, that means they group together. But basically, they're just one cell. All right? Okay. They have cell wall made of peptidoglycan. Now, we have seen it before, right? When you learn about the six kingdoms. So, bacteria is one of the kingdoms there. All right? Remember, you have two groups, uh, two kingdoms here. One is archaebacteria. The other one is eubacteria. They are both bacteria. Okay? They have cell wall. Uh, they are made of peptidoglycan. Now, we're talking about here... In this group here, bacteria, we're talking about the U bacteria. The U bacteria, which has cell wall made of peptidoglycan. Okay, the one which is archaebacteria, it does not have peptidoglycan. Okay, what is peptidoglycan? So if you see the word pept peptide or peptide, that actually refers to protein. So it has it's a mix, it is a, com a substance which is made up of protein combined with carbohydrate. Glycogen, glycan, glycan is one word, glycogen, or we call it glucose. So you has it has a combination of protein and polysaccharide. Right? Polysaccharide is one of the groups, uh, one of the structures, one of the uh, what they call the types of carbohydrate. So it's a combination of both uh, protein and the carbohydrate to make up the peptidoglycan. Okay, and some have capsules. So capsule is like an outer covering. It's a covering which protects the bacteria. So when the conditions are not favorable, for example, let's say it does not have enough oxygen, or it is it is in a not enough, uh, it doesn't have what you call um, let's say the correct temperature, it's too cold or it's too warm, too hot, they will actually uh, become dormant. Okay, the cell will become dormant and uh it will form a uh, it will become resting stage huh? and then you will have a structure to actually to make it it will form a spore and then it will actually stay at rest okay but the capsule is already there right capsule whether it's dormant or it is uh in active state the capsule is already there okay it's still there so bacteria do not have true nucleus okay we learned this before now what is the term we use that we will say back uh, a, a cell which does not have true nucleus so what kind of a uh, name do we specify for this okay i'll give you a keyword uh, i'll give you a first letter it starts with a p we have learned earlier in the six kingdoms out of the six kingdoms two are of this group and the other four are of the other group okay do you remember what i mentioned what kind of a cell what kind of cell is it if we say it does not have a true nucleus okay maybe you can uh type in your the chat box here and see how much remember. Mm, not yet, huh? I don't have to see any response. Maybe I can go on first, then you can please type in your response here. Okay, what are the what is the name that we classify for organisms that do not have true nucleus? 
Okay, let's look at the next one first. I will wait for you. I will go back to you and look at your comments later. Okay, their genetic material exists in the form of chromosomal threads. Okay, so they have DNA, right, which are scattered inside the cytoplasm, and they don't have what we call, remember, we don't have a membrane. We call it a nuclear membrane to cover the nuclear material. So they have nuclear material, but they don't have a membrane to cover it. Okay, that's why they are known as this name, which I want that name from you. Okay, and some bacteria have plasmid. Now, this is additional genes, additional DNA material, not DNA, additional genes, all right? Yeah, additional DNA, which actually are uh, extra. It is like outside of your nucleot. We call it plasmid. They're usually circular. So it's like a round shape like that, okay? It's a circular genetic material. We call it plasmid. I think I have some response already. Let me just have a look. Huh? Yes, correct. Prokaryote. You're right. Okay, Kasin, Yumin, and uh, Chung Win. Windy is uh, Win Yan, I think. Uh. Okay, prokaryote. You're right. Okay, so out of the uh, six kingdoms, right, two of them are prokaryotic, which is your RK bacteria and your U bacteria. And the other six, uh, four, sorry, four kingdoms, they are uh, U bacteria. Okay, so the uh, the these two first group, uh, RK bacteria and U bacteria, they are prokaryotes. Okay, but the other four, which is uh, the other Animalia, Plantae, okay, Protista, and also the uh, what is the other algae? Yes, they are in the they are in the what? They are in the other uh, U U karyote. Okay, so let's look at the next one. They have a uh, storage of food in the form of glycogen granules in the cytoplasm and they have flagellum for movement. Okay, let's look at the structures here. In a bacteria, you have to remember, you know how to label, uh, you need to remember how to label. So first of all, when you want to label, you can label the genetic material or call it nucleot, but please do not draw a membrane around it because they are prokaryotic. Then plasmid, see the plasmid here is a round circular thing, it's a circular DNA material, plasmid. Then you will have uh, on the surface of the bacteria, you have capsule, which protects the bacteria. Then there's cell wall underneath there, and this cell wall is peptidoglycan material. Then, of course, you have a plasma membrane, or inside, lah, you're going inside, okay, then cytoplasm. Now, on the outermost, to help it to move, you might have, uh, it will have flagella. Some of them have flagella, some of them do not have. So, flagellum is singular, flagella is plural. And you also have these small projections here. Actually, these are like small little filaments. They are called cilia. Cilia. Okay, so cilia are shorter. So how do you dif uh, how do you uh, differentiate cilia with flagellum? Okay, cilia is uh, plural. Singular is cilium. Flagella is plural. Singular is flagellum. Okay, flagella is long. Okay, and you don't have many of it. Maybe you just have a few. But cilia, you have it all over the body and it's short. So that's how you identify cilia from flagellum. Okay, next. Huh? Okay, let's go to the size. Now, how big or rather how small is your bacteria? Okay, so if we look, we, we, because they're so small, we classify or we count, quantify them in terms of micrometer. So micrometer is, I think you've learned in physics, huh? you have a long tail here. This is a mu, a micro, you draw it this way. And how small is a micrometer? So to give you an idea, you look at your ruler. Okay, you take out your ruler. So a ruler here, from here you can see this is a 6-inch ruler, which is 15 cm. Look at the 1 cm. All right, look at 1 cm. And in the 1 cm, you can see that there are further divisions. So you have 1 mm, correct? Now, from the 1 mm, look at that just 1 mm. Look at that just 1, one mm. They have a small little partition, uh, the smallest se the separate uh, partition you can see. You divide that, imagine, uh, you can't do it, right? You, you cannot divide it, but you imagine. You imagine that you divide that small little space into 1,000 times. You cut it up into 1,000 si uh, 1, smaller pieces. Okay, and that one little part here is called one micrometer. Okay, so you can, can you get imagine that uh, 1,000 micrometer makes up your one millimeter, 1,000 of it. So that is how small a micrometer here is. So one micrometer is one over 1,000 of an mm. You need 1,000 of this micrometer, one micrometer to make up your one mm. 
Okay, so imagine that uh, in your uh, for your bacteria, the size of the micro uh, the uh, size of the bacteria can be one micrometer up to ten micrometer. That means in one mm you can fit one hundred to one thousand bacteria side by side, not clumped together. You know, not like you know, just like a ball. It's a one by one side by side. You can put one hundred up to one thousand bacteria in your one mm space here so you can imagine how small it is okay you need you really need a uh you, you can't see with the naked definitely bacteria you can't see with the naked eye you need a uh electron microscope to see it, okay now let's look at the uh nutrition now before we go to the nutrition you will see all these very very bombastic words huh? autotrophic heterotrophic and all that so i would like to explain all this first what are the types of nutrition? When I go to this, you understand, okay? Because I want you to see the overall picture, as usual. I want you to see the overall picture. It's more structured that way. Okay, let's look at the type of nutrition of all the animals or all the organisms, right? Plants or animals, whatever, in this whole world. The types of nutrition can be classified to... Let me check. Uh, where is it? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. All right, here. There are actually two types of nutrition right of all the living things we call it organisms doesn't matter whether you're big or you're small whether you're a plant or an animal whether you're bacteria or you are a, an elephant all right are you able to hear me yeah can i right can i can i right okay i think okay yeah if you can't please uh, alert me anytime uh. i would i'm going to check on your messages from time to time okay now let's look at the types of nutrition all right, now, two types. No matter what kind of organism, you have only two types of nutrition first. The first classification is either your autotrophic or your heterotrophic. Okay, what is autotrophic? What is heterotrophic? Okay, now, auto means, as you know, auto. Auto means automatic. Automatic means you can do it on your own. Okay, things that you can do on your own is called auto. So, autotrophic are organisms which are able to produce their own food. Okay, very simple. Huh? As you know, the first thing you can think of is just the green plant, isn't it? The green plants, which are able to carry out photosynthesis. Correct. They are autotrophic because they are able to use the light energy to uh, convert them into chemical energy. That means food stored in the carbohydrates. That is autotrophic. All right. Now, under autotrophic, there are two types. Depending on what kind of energy they make use of, what kind of energy are they using to make the food? So if they're using light energy, we will call it as photoautotrophic. All right. So photoautotrophic are those plant or animals or I'm sorry, organisms which are able to use light energy to produce their food. Because of photo, photo means light. Okay, so autotrophic is just able to make, but what type of energy they use depends on what they use are, okay? So if they use light, you call it photo-autotrophic. Now, the other one is called chemo-autotrophic. As the word chemo suggests, it means chemical. So they are able to use the energy from a conversion of a substance to another substance. That means a chemical reaction. So they're able to convert certain substances to another substance. And from that conversion there, they will produce the energy. And they use that energy to make their food okay so these are certain bacteria. okay certain bacteria which are able to uh, use the energy released from converting one substance to another substance it's actually a chemical reaction lah, all right they use the energy from there to make their food so these organisms are called chemo autotrophic chemo autotrophic all right okay so now you know what are autotrophic uh, uh, feeding okay nutrition now all those organisms that do not make their own food, okay, they are not able to uh, provide, they make their own food. So they are, come under the second category, which is heterotrophic. Heterotrophic. All right, hetero means many different, many different types. Hetero, okay, like in Cantonese you say lap chap, ah. right, it's called hetero, many, many different types. That's called hetero. Now, under heterotrophic, there are three. There are three types. You have saprotrophic, holozoic, and parasitic. Okay, yeah. Now, what is we go one by one first? Saprotrophic. 
Now, saprotrophic, uh, what are these organisms? These are the organisms that are actually they live on dead organic matter. That means they are living on uh, things that are dead, like for example, tree bark or the tree that is already dead, right? Or they live on uh, dead animals, their body. And they, what they do is they actually decompose the, they break down the organic matter, like protein, right? In the body, there's protein, right? Protein, carbohydrate, and lipid. So these organisms, they will convert this lipid, uh, protein, and carbohydrate into less complex substances. Example, they produce water, all right? When they break it down, they get water. They break it down, they get carbon dioxide, okay? So they these organisms, they convert all this uh, sub organic substance like uh, protein, lipid, and so on to make it into simpler substances. And from there, all right, they will get the energy. So they are called saprotrophic. Okay, they will actually take their and a food from that. They take their food from this uh, dead organic matter. So they decompose dead organic matter, and the whole seal is dead. Nah? Okay, remember. So remember for saprotrophic nutrition, the host the host is the where they they stay on nah, their food nah, is actually dead they're no longer alive okay so examples would be like the fungus quite a lot of fungus they live on dead organic matter for example mushrooms and so on they live on barks and so on okay and then uh, there are also certain bacteria that does that they decompose and they break down those dead bodies and so on okay that are already buried in the ground okay next group holozoic Holozoic are organisms that actually have to bring in the food into their body and digest inside the body. So they ingest. Ingestion is actually to bring the food inside our body. Just like we, we are under holozoic because definitely we are not autotrophic. We can't make food ourselves. Our body cannot make the food. And also we do not feed on dead organic matter to get their food. What we do is we bring in the protein and the carbohydrate and the lipid from the food and we eat it inside our body. So... This is kind of ingestion. Nah? Ingestion means eating it, all right? And this uh, kind of nutrition is called holozoic. So same like for many animals, tiger also holozoic because they eat rabbits, okay, let's say, all right? And rabbit also is holozoic because they eat grass or they eat carrots. Uh, that is, they have to actually eat the food inside, okay? Many organisms are holozoic, okay? Now, next one, another group here is parasitic. So as the name suggests, parasites, uh, you know parasites, right? Parasites are those organisms that depend on another organisms for food. They absorb and they take in nutrient from there. Okay, so they something similar to saprotrophic. That means they do not make their own food, neither do they digest their own food. They just suck and absorb the food from the another organism. Okay, in that case, uh, what is the difference between parasitic and saprotrophic? Okay, they also need a host, correct? Both of them need the host, all right? Both of them need the host, but the difference here is for saprotrophic, the host is dead, okay? The host is dead. But for parasitic, for example, will be your mosquito is actually a parasite huh? because of, even though they don't stay on your skin, but they come from time to time and they suck your food, right? And they suck your, your blood. And uh, there are also those uh, fungus that grow on your your feet, all right, uh, in between your, you know, they say this is your feet, right? in between here, sometimes you feel itchiness and so on, right? So it's because fungus are growing that. So it gives you a skin disease. This is actually fungus growing that. So they stay on the surface. So they are called ectoparasite. Ecto means outside, they're outside your body. But there are also some inside your body, for example, worms, okay? Worms like little kids, right? they like to play with the soil and all that. And then the eggs of the worms are in the, in the, you know, under, buried in the, under the fingernails. Then they don't wash their fingers. They don't wash their hands when they eat, right? And all these eggs will go into your body. So that's how they get the worms. So these worms, they latch onto the digestive tract and uh, they do not get, dige uh, they do not get digested and they do not get uh, removed from our our intestines because they are very they have this special suction they get they, they will cling on tightly on our uh, intestines and they will absorb food from our uh, intestines okay so they are living or rather we are living all right the host is still living so they absorb food from us because uh, and while we are still alive okay so for parasitic their host is alive but for the saprotrophic their host is dead so that is the main difference. Okay, now, so I hope you get the 
clear picture after when I talk about the types of nutrition for bacteria, you will understand. Okay, so some of the bacteria they are autotrophic, some they are heterotrophic because there are many different types. They can be this here, they can be here, they can be also here because their nutrition is different. Okay, let's go back to the bacteria. All right. Okay, let's go back to the bacteria here. Let's look at the types of nutrition. Now, so photo, there are, there are groups of there are certain bacteria which are autotrophic. Okay, so they are under autotrophic. You have also photo and chemo. So some are able to uh, make food using the light energy because they have chlorophyll. Okay, so in order to make uh, you to make food from the light, you need to have chlorophyll. The other one is chemo autotrophic. All right, they use energy from the chemical reaction of converting one substance to another substance. So it produces energy and then they use the energy too as their source of the food, right? Next one, heterotrophic. Most of the other types of bacteria, they are, all, they are heterotrophic. So under heterotrophic, they are saprophytic. So when I just I mentioned, remember, right? Uh, bacteria, this kind of saprophytic organisms, they will break down the dead organisms and they digest the organ, organic matter externally. That means the, the digestion is external. They will produce the enzyme, all right, and they will break it down, and then they will absorb it inside the body. Okay, so they're saprophytic. For parasitic, they live in the host or either inside the body or outside the body, okay, on the surface, and they absorb the, they suck the food from the host. But these are a living host. So that's the difference here. Yeah? All right, so you have bacteria of two types. They, are, they can be autotrophic, they can also be heterotrophic. Okay, so because there's so many types of bacteria. Okay, next. Now, how many uh, groups of bacteria there are? Okay, before that, let's look at some examples. Lactobacillus. Ah, I'm sure you remember this name. Ah. When you hear this advertisement for Vitagen and what Yakult, you know, these culture drinks, we have uh, we use make use of lactobacillus. So, and also in production of cheese, when we convert uh, uh, milk into cheese, we also need bacteria to do the job. Okay, so you have lactobacillus uh, for the production of yogurt. You have as lactobacillus acidophilus, lactobacillus cassii. There are so many different types of lactobacillus. Okay, and E. coli. Uh, now, if you look at here, SP is at the back here. So, lactobacillus is the genus name. It must be written in italics. So, remember uh, when you are type, typing it, it must be in italics for the genus and species. But if you do not know the species, you just write SP sp dot okay and for italics genus is italicized while as for sp you don't have to italicize it because it's not specific okay then e coli and e coli stands for estricture H coli this is the uh, type of bacteria which can uh they are in the stomach i'm uh, no, sorry they are in the intestines okay salmonella this is the type of bacteria which causes food poisoning okay you've heard of salmonella poisoning i'm sure Okay, when you have cross-contamination of meat, chicken meat, beef, or whatever meat that there is. Okay, next one. Four types, four groups. Okay, we'll follow the textbook. There are four groups of bacteria based on the shape, actually. They are based on, they are classified according to shape. Okay, I'll do a different color here. Okay, here. So, shape. First of all, first shape is called uh, spherical, like a ball. All right, we call it cocus. So specific name of coccus, all right? You have micrococcus, diplococcus. Micro means uh, just coccus are on its own, uh, run by one. Diplococcus is two by two, so they live together, okay? You have streptococcus as well in a chain. So you see, you join it up together, you get a chain here. Streptococcus. Example of this streptococcus is streptococcus pneumoniae. This is the type of bacteria which causes pneumonia. That means it attacks our lungs. Okay, you get a uh, radang paru paru infection of the lungs. Then the other staphylococcus. This one, the bacteria they group together. We call it colonies, huh? In uh, what you call like a bunch. They looks like a bunch of grapes. Okay, so staphylococcus, like a bunch of grapes like this. All right, and uh, one example of this is the staphylococcus aureus, which causes uh, pimples on your skin, and also it uh, causes throat infection. So it attacks your upper respiratory tract. Okay, next one, bacillus. Bacillus is rod shape. That means it's like, you know, longish, long, long shape like that. So it's, it can be single, it can be double, it can be a chain, right? 
So this is bacillus. Next group is spirillum. Spirillum is spiral. And that, okay, like a ribbon like that. So spiral, right? Okay, before that, you also have flagellate. Uh, flagellate means got flagella. So this one means like that. Flagellate. Flagellate bacillus, all right? So spirillum is spiral shape. And the VBO, they are comma shape. So it looks like a comma like this. Now, this example is cholera, vibrio cholerae. Vibrio cholerae is the bacteria which causes uh, cholera. Okay, cholera is like what we call in Cantonese, say, all outing. Uh. All outing is like uh, the person vomits a lot. Okay, they cannot hold the, uh, we cannot uh, call retain liquid in our body. So, a lot of going to the toilets, uh, uh, maybe one day or uh, five, six times, and it's very watery stools. So, uh, in BM, we call it taun, penyakit taun. Okay, so that's caused by. Uh, viral uh, this a uh, bacterial infection in the intestines okay and of course uh, some bacteria are uh, most of the bacteria are able to form spores whenever they are common or uh, whenever they are not in favorable conditions they will become a spore which you can keep for i mean they can become uh, stay dormant for a long time okay now what about uh, reproduction okay they reproduce asexually most of them reproduce asexually. Yeah, in fact, all of them, yeah. Asexually by binary fission. So this, in fact, this is the most efficient way of reproduction for asexual because it can reproduce very fast under favorable conditions, okay? In just as little as 20 minutes, you can have the next generation already, okay? That means one bacteria is able to produce another generation. That means one becomes two in just 20 minutes. And from your two bacteria, Another 20 minutes later, you're going to get four. Another 20 minutes again, you're going to get eight. So you see, it's the exponential. The pertambahan, uh, we call the increment, is the like exponential. So it's a very, it's a, a very efficient uh, method of uh, reproduce, uh, reproducing. And it is usually done when it's favorable condition, binary fission. Okay? So, and if there are unfavorable conditions, if they are come under unfavorable conditions, not enough water, too hot, too cold, or whatever, they can form spores. Okay, and under with spores here, they can live for many years in a dormant state without food or air. Uh, so that's why it's so dangerous. Uh, bacteria, you, 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 you can kill them, yes, but you need very high temperature. Usually, for to killing sp uh, spores, you need to have uh, one hundred and twenty one degrees Celsius. And how to achieve this 121 degrees Celsius, you need to have at least 15 PSI, pound per square inch. That means you have high pressure. You can do it in a pressure cooker. Pressure cooker will be able to achieve 121 degrees Celsius. So you boil it for about at least 20 minutes. You should be able to uh, sterilize or kill the bacteria and also their spores, bacteria and also spores. We call it sterilized. When you want to use the term sterilized, it means your spores must also be killed not just cooking it under, let's say, water. Because in our normal uh, you know, stove, we can only achieve 100 degrees Celsius or maybe a little bit higher without a uh, pressure cooker. Because if under high pressure, you can your temperature can go higher. So you can get about 121 degrees Celsius if with a pressure cooker, okay? At least, uh, and then you, you can actually uh, kill spores in this, in this way. Lah. Okay, so now this is a the way of... Uh, Binary fission. Okay, so I want to show you. Oh, uh, yeah, when the spores, uh, they are, I said they are common, right? So when they um, come under favorable conditions, when they have favorable conditions later, for example, uh, you take it out from the freezer, there's spores on the frozen meat, right? And then you defrost it. So your spores that's already on the frozen meat, it will actually germinate when it comes into room temperature later. So that's why it's a good practice not to refreeze uh, uh, food that's already defrosted. Because once you defrost it, you're actually making the bacteria to become active. So, and then if you're not eating it, you're not cooking it directly, yeah, the bacteria would actually multiply already. So it's always a good practice to defrost what you need and you cook it straight away. You don't defrost it. And you bring it back into the freezer because by the time you bring it back to the freezer, your bacteria would have multiplied already. Okay, so that's what it means by that. That's why I say never uh, refreeze uh, thawed food. Okay, let's look at the picture. Uh. Let's look at some pictures first. Now, this is bacillus. These are uh, pictures taken under the electron microscope. Okay, so this is 
cocus. You can see this is cocus, but I think in groups. Uh, so you, I think we call it uh, staphylococcus. This one in groups, okay? And here, a combination of all three. You have cocus here, you have bacillus here, and you have your spirillum, okay? And this is uh, bacillus with the rod shape. Right? How do I know it's bacillus because of the rod shape? Then you can see the cilia, right? You can see the cilia here. And here, you have multiple flagella. Okay, and the method of cell division, and let me check, where is it? Oh, yeah, okay. So, bacterial, uh, binary fusion uh, over here. I don't have it. I think they have it for the amoeba. Okay, let's go to the last part. Um, respiration, most of them are aerobic, uh, but some are anaerobic. That means they do not need oxygen. So, it's like sometimes they can really survive everywhere because you have places which are lack of oxygen. You can still have bacteria there. Okay, so mostly you have it in the soil, in the air, everywhere. In fact, bacteria is so prevalent in everywhere. It's in your mouth. As you speak also, it's in your mouth, all right? Uh, it's in on your skin, everywhere. It's on your clothes, it's on the table, everywhere, okay? So that's why you have to look after your personal hygiene. If you do not want to get infected. And most importantly, do not give away, uh, do not give a, a chance for the bacteria to enter your body. Like let's say through cuts. So we have a cut, that's where bacteria are able to enter your, your system. Okay, let's go to the second one, protozoa. All right, I hope there's uh, is there any question. Maybe you can leave it later for our discussion later in Google Meet, okay? So protozoa. Now protozoa, this is larger. They are larger compared to bacteria. They are basically animals, right? Because they are able to move. Animal-like, I would say. They are not really animal. Because there's a, one group called Luglena, which has chlorophyll, which is quite, you know, it's like in neither nor. No. It's actually in both. Uh, some scientists classify the Luglena and the protozoa, and some also classify them in algae. So they exist in both uh, groups, actually, this Luglena, because they are able to move, but they have chloroplasts, okay? Or they have chlorophyll. So... They are unicellular. Huh? So I remember remember the protozoa, they're all unicellular. They live on their own single cells. They're usually in aquatic environment. So they need water. Okay, aquatic or semi-aquatic. Huh? They can be seen under low power. Huh? This one you can see, right? You can, like I said, you, with your naked eye, you can see a little speck there. It could be an amoeba. When you put it under the microscope, you can see even much better, bigger, all right? They have a uh, nucleus. Cytoplasm, so this is the basic three substances nah, for a living cell. You need to have a nucleus, a cytoplasm, and also plasma membrane. All right, so they are able to carry out all the seven processes of living things. For example, they have to eat, right, feeding. They will produce waste, digestion, I'm sorry, uh, excretion, produce waste, digestion. They will digest the food. They respire, means they carry out respiration. They are able to reproduce, they are able to grow, and they're able to move, okay? So growth as well. They show growth. Huh? All these are seven uh, processes. And also one more thing, uh, they're able to show uh, response to stimuli. So when you shine the light from one direction, the paramecia will run away to the other side because they do not like uh, bright conditions, a bright environment. Okay, and how do they move around? They are either three ways they can move around. They have pseudopodia, which they extend their cytoplasm out. All right, and then it's called false feet. Huh? Pseudo means false, feet means podia. Or they have cilia. Cilia, I remember just I said the short little projections on the surface there, which will actually help in motility, movement. Or a long one, which is called a flagella. So this is flagella. All these things here are flagella. For paramecia, no flagella, they have cilia. Okay. So what do they belong to? Uh, is under protista, protista, and the size here is much bigger compared to bacteria. So in one mm, you can fit four to two hundred only, compared to just now. Just now was like one hundred to one thousand uh, bacteria in one mm. So they are slightly bigger than the bacteria. What type of nutrition? So remember, some of them are having they have chlorophyll, so they can be autotroph. But most of them are heterotroph. Okay, most of them are able. They, they like amoeba and paramecium. They cannot produce their own food, so they have to ingest. They have to eat their food. All right, like the you know uh, amoeba, they will extend their cytoplasm out, and then the uh, pseudopodium, and then they engulf the food. The process is called what? Eh? remember how does amoeba eat the thing? Okay, 
maybe you can you can uh, uh, put in the comment there. What is the process by which they extend their pseudopodium, they engulf the food and bring into the body? This is for amoeba. What is the type of uh, process called? What is the process called? Okay, I'll wait for your response in a while. Let me carry on. Now, some are parasitic. Yeah, there are some which actually cause diseases. So, protista, they are not altogether all good. Eh? There are some which cause uh, diseases like plasmodium. Plasmodium causes malaria. Okay, uh, this is uh, brought by uh, in, uh, this mosquito, mosquito Anopheles, the female Anopheles mosquito. Trypanosoma, which causes sleeping sickness, a sleeping disease. Okay, Penyakitido. <laughs> That's mostly in Africa. Yeah, it's brought by the CC fly. It's a fly, yeah. Fly brings. So the fly is actually not the one causing the disease. The fly brings this pro, uh, protozoa inside the body. And when they bite you or whatever, they will actually inject that thing into your body. Okay, the, the plasmodium or the trypanosoma. Okay, let me see whether I have any response from you for the. Ha, okay, good. Phagocytosis. Yes, phagocytosis is correct. Yeah, phagocytosis. Mm, yes. Where they engulf the food and bring it inside, that is phagocytosis. Okay, so let's go on a little bit more about protista. I'll show some pictures. Okay, interesting part is the pictures. Lah, okay, so let's look at this. Now, example, just remember your two examples, very simple. Paramecium and amoeba. Okay, this one should be in italics. Huh? So this one. Wrongly typed, man. should be italics, all right. Should be type italics, just like the trypanosoma, yes, and also plasmodium. Plasmodium causes malaria, trypanosoma causes sleeping disease. Okay, sexually and asexually for asexually, it's always binary fission because it's a very efficient way of uh, producing the next generation. Respiration is uh, for aerobic, uh, it means it requires oxygen. So they live everywhere. They usually in aquatic environments. So usually places that have with water in the long tongue as well, in the soil, river, ponds, drains, right? Sea water and other inside our body as well because we have water. Okay, let's look at some pictures. Okay, now look at the pictures. How were you able to draw? How are you going to draw the euglena? You must be able to rec uh, recognize first. Euglena looks like this. It has a singular flagellum, singular. It has chlorophyll. So if you look under the microscope, you can see that they're green, okay? And you can see this strand coming out here. That is the flagellum, singular. So call it, I call it flagellum then. Okay, next, let's look at the paramecium. How are you able to label the paramecium? So make sure you remember you need all these things. Huh? It has got two nucleus. One is a macronucleus, one is the micronucleus. Mm. And here you have contractile vacuum, which is important in osmoregulation. We learned that in form 4. If, because they live in freshwater environment, water will move into the cell. So if, if there's uh, no way to control the input and intake of water, uh, this, the cell is going to burst because a lot of water will come in. So they want to uh, remove extra water, excessive water. You have, need to have a mechanism, and that mechanism is a contractile vacuum. So the excess water moves into the contractile vacuum, so it's going to expand, and later on, it's going to pump it, the water outside. Okay? Then this is the mouth. We call it the oral groove where the food comes in. So this is holozoic nutrition, where they actually ingest the food. Okay? Then after that, they form the food vacuum called the cytosome. Okay? Then after that, I don't forget the cytoplasm. And here you can see a lot of cilia. Okay, all over the body, you have cilia. And the anal pore is for them to remove the undigested material. All right, okay, so it looks like a pair. It looks like slippers, basically. When you see that, you should know it's a paramecium. Okay, so let me see what you have the... Ah, Fagos, I just got the answer. Yeah, okay. So next, what about this one? Amoeba, how are you going to draw the amoeba? Amoeba, make sure you need to know how to draw your nucleus. You have the nucleus there. Then you have your food vacuum, right? Sometimes you, of course, sometimes you may see that. Sometimes you cannot see that. And the contractile vacuum is in a circular shape. This is to remove the water out. Okay, not star shape. For the paramecium, it's like a star shape. Then uh, it has, uh, of course, the pseudopodium. Pseudopodium, and actually, there are two types, uh, two kinds of 
cytoplasm. One is the near the outer side, so ectoplasm and endoplasm. Okay, it doesn't matter the difference. Like endoplasm is more to inside. Like. Ectoplasm is more there. It's more fluid so that it can step. Okay, and when you want to draw amoeba, okay, I want to I highlight some mistakes that students always use, always do. Number one is you they tend to use arrows. So never, never use arrow unless you are pointing out direction. Arrows are only used for direction. So you do not point or do not label it by using arrow. Arrow shows something is coming inside. So it looks like a lot of things coming inside. Okay, do not do that. You all instead use just one line. Okay, next thing is for the nucleus, it should not be empty because if it's empty, it looks like a vacuum, like uh, the food, uh, we call it the vacuum, yeah, vacuum of the plant cell, right, where you have a lot of water inside there and your mineral salt and all that. So you always type, always draw, dot, 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 make it dense, all right? You must draw like that. And then here, uh, yeah, you can see the food being engulfed here. So these are the things that you should avoid, like, the mistakes when you draw your biology diagrams. Okay, this is a picture of an actual amoeba. You can see it expands the pseudopodium, all right? And you can see one is actually eating up the whatever organic matter there, lah, okay? The eating up maybe could uh, be a smaller organism than itself. Okay, this is pseudopodium, right? So you would label this would be pseudopodium. Okay, and let's look at, uh, uh, go back to paramecium. Uh, paramecium, you say that just now we say got sexual and asexual reproduction, right? So binary fission is, of course, for asexual. Now, how do paramecium's uh, reproduce sexually? They have something called conjugation. This is sexual reproduction. This is sexual reproduction for uh, paramecium, where two individuals or paramecium's, they will come together and they will actually uh, exchange genetic material. Can you see that? So when I exchange genetic material, as you learned in uh, your form four before, when you have an exchange of genetic material, the product of that will not be the same as your parents. So the next generation will have a combination of genes. We call it a recombination of genetic material. So the next generation, you will have new characteristics. So sexual reproduction is always better in the sense that you will get to produce uh, better material, I call it a chance for variation, which could be good if the environment changes later, okay? So if the, every, if you do not want everything to be the same all along. So you can see all this, this is conjugation, where the uh, paramecium are coming together and exchanging genetic material, okay? So they also have sexual, also now don't think that they're lower life forms, uh, they will always have uh, asexual, not true, okay? Sometimes they do have their own mechanism. Okay, let's go to algae. Now algae, what are algae? Algae is basically it's just a plant cell. Lah. But why don't we put under plantae then? Why do we put them under algae? So a very simple classification is when you look at the algae, you're not able to identify where is the root, where is the stem, which is, where are the leaves. So there's no distinctive part where you can say, okay, this is the root, this is the stem, this is the leaves. No. And some of the algae are very small. They can become, they become, uh, they are actually unicellular. Okay, so it's the smallest green plants. So they are all able to produce their food because they all have chlorophyll. For algae, one characteristic is they all can produce their food. They are autotrophic. Okay, they are autotrophic. So they consist of examples. Just remember a few examples like the Chlamydomonas. Okay, I'm sure you, I'll show you the pictures afterwards. Chlamydomonas. Okay, and some which are big. They're called uh, like brown algae. You know, you, you like to eat seaweed, right? In Korea, they breed a lot of seaweed. In Japan also. So they eat a lot of seaweed. Now, so seaweed, they are all algae. And they are not microscopic, right? You notice that they're not very much. They're very big pieces, ma. So algae, you can range from very small to one cell to multicellular. A whole piece of seaweed is actually algae. So it has got millions of cells. So it's not only, you say, unicellular. It also can be multicellular. Okay, so it's unicellular and multicellular. Some are just very small and some are actually very big. Okay, so they all have chlorophyll and their cell wall is made of cellulose, something like the plantae kingdom. Lah. Okay, so here's the important classification. They have no leaves, sorry. They have no leaves, no stem, no roots. That's why we can't put them under plantae. They don't have vascular tissues. They don't have specific leaves or roots. So, yeah, 
us, uh, technically speaking. Okay, and some may have flagella to move around in the water. So they are very, uh, they are basically green, right? But it was sometimes we see on the in the longkang something green there at the side of the longkang. It's possibly algae. When you have an aquarium where you rare fish, you will see a lot of green stuff right on the surface of the glass, isn't it? If you, especially when you have not cleaned the aquarium for a long time, right? You don't clean it, you can see, wow, it's so dirty, it's all greenish already. That, that those are algae living there. Okay. Let's look at them. Ah, we'll finish first and look at some pictures. Huh? Protista, the kingdom is Protista. Now, how small are they or how big are they? Now, in one mm, you can uh, you have a zero point one. That means it's more uh, very uh, means one uh, one one cm. Uh, you, the smallest is one cm. Uh, up to one thousand algae. Uh, you know, the, the the biggest is one cm. Uh, and the smallest is about uh one micrometer. That means one thousand algae can fit in your one mm. That's the smallest one. Or you want to have it in larger perspective, in 1 cm, you can have either 1 or up to 10,000 algae. So it depends on the different types of algae. Some are small, some are big. Okay, They are all autotrophic because they are able to make their own food. Examples, right? Uh, green algae, red algae, there's so many types. All algae, all the seaweeds, they are algae. Okay, they are blue-green algae, brown algae, yellow algae, sparogyra, plamidomonas. Okay, they are able to... Re, uh, reproduce sexually and asexually. Okay, this is pictures. Now here, you see under the electron microscope, uh, this is uh, algae. Some of them are chlorella. I think you'll see this chlorella. Some of you eat chlorella as a supplement. Okay, chlorella, chlorella sp. And this is volvox. Okay, now diatoms as well. The diatoms, they are very beautiful because they are geometric in shape. They are also under algae. They are called, uh, they are also like phytoplankton. Look at this word here, algae. Where is the, where is the diatoms? Oh, don't see the word here, diatoms. Huh? Yeah, never mind. They are called diatoms. Huh? They are here, here. They are food for actually very small little, little creatures in the water, in the ocean. So they are diatoms. They are able to produce their own food. And what's so beautiful about them? Because they look like glass. Remember? I see they look like glass, right? You can see because their outer covering is made of silica. And silica is a substance that makes glass, you know. So they are called diatoms. Okay, now look at algae here. Uh, this one, this is a delicacy in uh, Japanese and uh, Korean food, I think. You have all these, like, you know, little, little, look like bust, bursting. Uh, when you put into your mouth and eat them, the, the water will spread out. So it's called bursting algae. I don't know why they call it bursting algae or not, but I think there's a specific name for that. This is a delicacy, all right, in uh, Korean, in Korea and Japan. I don't think we have it here. So if you look at the aquarium, you will have all these things, right? They have all algae, all right? Algae, brown algae, different many types of algae. Now you will see on a lake, uh, so dirty, yeah. Uh, all right, this is somebody's hand scooping out that thing. This is algae bloom. You see all the algae all covering the top surface. So this is a uh, thousands and thousands of this unicellular but they're because so many they all mix they all group up together then you can see a big mass of uh, algae okay right let's go on to the next one huh? we're coming to the end another two more groups okay this is the third group okay the fourth group here you look at the fungi okay fungi fungi are basically the opposite of algae so as you know we say algae has got chlorophyll right so fungi definitely no chlorophyll Okay, just remember fungi, always remember the example mushroom. Right? You never see green mushroom, right? Mushroom is either gray, white, or black. Correct? So all fungus are either gray, white, or black. Especially uh, you know, uh, many of the food that we eat are fungi, you know, uh, especially Chinese New Year. A lot of Chinese like to eat the bonsai, isn't it? You have the wood year, mok yi, and the wan yi and all that, right? And uh, many types of fungus all mixed together in the dish then called the lohon tai and all that. Okay, also you have the fat choy, yeah, the black color hair like that. You know, it's all fungus, uh, especially uh, of course the mushroom lah. So what uh, are the characteristics? So they do not have chlorophyll, do not have chlorophyll, right? They of course don't have stem roots or leaves. They are very simpler versions of plants. With the fact that they don't have uh, chlorophyll as well. They can be seen at a low power, or you can also use a magnifying glass is enough. Because sometimes you see on your bread, moldy bread, uh, bread already fat, may, uh, already uh, expired bread, you will see some strands, white color strands on top. And uh, that is actually bread mold. Bread mold, another name is called new core. 
mucosa break more. Okay, so they are made of what now? What the walls? The walls of the fungus. These are high face or the tubes here, the little little, not just like akka. It's not the akka. I don't call it root. Lah. they're not root. They are made of material called uh, polysaccharide and chitin. So chitin is a substance which gives it a uh, hardness. So it's a fibrous substance here, consisting of polysaccharide. So it's a kind of carbohydrate, which you can find in many insects. The shell, not outer shell of the insects, they also have chitin. And of course, also the cell of fungi. They have this material called chitin. It is a polysaccharide, okay, under carbohydrate. So how do they feed? How do they eat? They don't have chlorophyll, so they cannot make their own food. So they have to get their food from somewhere. So what do they do is they excrete, uh, under they secrete, they secrete, uh, they produce the enzymes. Enzymes will come outside of their, of their cells and they actually digest the material outside where they stay on. Uh, okay, They will live on the organic matter. They will digest it and then they will absorb the nutrient inside. Okay, So they secrete enzymes. They break down the organic matter into uh, simpler molecules and they absorb it inside. Okay, so let's look at some terms here. What are called hyphae? These are thread-like structures. So you can see all this thread-like. When you look at your moldy bread, you can see a lot of this hair-like thing. So one of it is called hypha. If you have um, plural, it's called hyphae. Okay, that's called hyphae. Lah. But if you have see a whole network of it, everything is all like intertwined. Everything all joined up together. We call it mycelium. Okay, a mass of hyphae is called mycelium. So hypha is just looking at one on its own. If you have a lot of it, you call it mycelium. Okay, and uh, okay, so these are fungus. They are mostly uh, lay a uh, black, green, or uh, black, no green, uh, black, gray, or or, or dark colors. Uh. Uh, white lah, and also some they are colorful. You no, know? I want to show you some colorful mushrooms. <laughs> now, mushrooms here there are many types. So here this is the one we can eat, right? We always can we can buy from the supermarket. They are packed in plastic with a container, and they are called uh, shimeji. I think shimeji mushroom. Now you can eat that, but do not just simply go about plucking mushrooms whenever you see them, ah, huh? because there are many mushrooms which are poisonous. So I've heard of people who actually have food poisoning eating wild mushroom. So do not go and eat wild mushroom. So like for example, this red color thing, I don't think it's safe to eat. Huh? So you have red color as well. Okay. Then you have uh, this one also. This is also a fungus, right? Growing on the bark on the tree. You see, this is you can see in the forest or this. This is the uh, same, almost similar to the lingji. Yeah, we call it ganoderm. Okay, lingji. Now you see, mushroom also got cup shape. You know. Cup shape, see red color. Then you got spongy shape one, like sponge. That there's so many different types of mushroom, and they're colorful. No, so do not, uh, just pick up any mushroom and eat. Huh? they could be poisonous. You can get poisoning. Okay, let's look at this one. This is yeast. Now yeast also come under fungus. Yeast. This is yeast. Yeast that you used to make your bread, right? Make your bread, and also what else? Huh? make uh, yeah, for fermentation, right? And also, yeah, correct. So this one is. You can see the little buds coming up. Uh, they budding, budding. You see all the baby coming up. That is their way of reproduction for yeast. For the bread mold, like mucor, I think it's rhizopora mucor. You see all this? These are on the bread. You can see all this, one, one of this coming up here. All right. And then at the top of it, you have this sporangium. Sporangium are those structures which carry spores inside. So they have spore formation. They produce spore. So once it Mature, it will rupture, and the spores will fly out, will disperse that way. That's how they will spread. Okay, so here is mycelium. The whole mass of it is called mycelium. You want to single out the thing is called hypha. All right. Okay, this is a diagram to show that. All right. Let's go on to the last part here of the uh, fungus. So the heterotrophs. I remember you say a week it does not produce food, right? So it has to be heterotroph. They can be saprophyte, they can live on dead organic matter, or they can also be parasites. The yeah, unicellular example is yeast, and for multicellular, the examples are the mushroom. Mushroom definitely cannot be unicellular, it's so big. So big it's for thousands and millions of cells. Huh? So some are medible and some are poisonous. Huh? Like I said, huh? do not go and pluck any mushroom you see huh? after it rains. Huh? Okay, now reproduction asexual by budding for yeast. And mostly uh, the others will be formation of spores. 
gay sports and budding. And they carry out anaerobic. Some may, some are able to carry out anaerobic, some lah. Okay, some. Not uh, uh most of of course all carry out aerobic, but some may be able to carry out anaerobic. And they all like the dark and damp places. So if you want to kill off fungus, it's very easy. You make sure that it is warm. And I'm not, it's, it is hot or it is too or cold. You put it in the fridge, it won't grow fungus. Or you uh, put it in sunlight. Okay, you put it in the sunlight, then the fungus will not grow. Okay, now we go to the last part now. Okay, let me see if you have any uh, questions here. Mm, nothing here. So let's go to the last part, which is uh, phagos, like, oh, sorry, which is virus. Now, virus of all the five types, uh, this is the smallest and the most difficult to control and the most difficult to handle, right? Because they are able to, uh, actually what we call it, able to exist forever, you know, in a sense that um, it is not classified as a living thing, right? The reason why is because it is not a cell. We cannot call it a cell because it does not have cytoplasm, it does not have nucleus, it does not have plasma membrane. So you need all these three in order to call a cell. You need, in order to call it a cell, you need a, a cytoplasm, you need cytoplasm, you need nucleus, you also need uh, the plasma membrane. But it doesn't have all of this. So that's why it's acellular. So we call it acellular. It's not a cell, but it's microorganism because it is small. Okay. Now, why we call it microorganism? It's not a living thing. Actually, it does show properties of living things only when it enters a living cell. When it attacks a cell, ah, it will come alive. Okay, before it attacks a cell, it's like dead. It doesn't do anything. It's just like a speck of dust on the table. Right? It can, you can remain there forever. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't respire. It doesn't need oxygen. It doesn't do anything at all. It doesn't even have to uh, grow. It doesn't do anything. Right. But once it's able to come into your body, once it infects the cell, ah, then it comes alive. It becomes a living thing, right? So that's why it's a peculiar thing about virus is they exhibit properties or characteristics of living thing and also non-living thing. Okay, so let's look at this. Now, this is the smallest, right? Can only be seen under electron microscope. It also must be high power, not very high power. Otherwise, you cannot see it. Oh, this is the smallest one, okay? It is not a cell, so we call it acellular. Okay, because it doesn't have cell membrane, it doesn't have cytoplasm, it doesn't have nucleus. So in that case, what does it have? So if you want to label a virus, you do not label this, what do you label? You label only two things. There are only two things you need to label. Number one is the nuclear material. It has nucleic acid. Nucleic acid can be either DNA or RNA. That's all, right? It's either DNA or RNA. It has nuclear material. It has the, uh, the genetic material. The genetic material, all right? And another thing you need to label is the outer coat, the covering. The outer coat is called capsid, okay? It's made of protein. I have to put a different color here. All right, it is a protein, actually. So you don't call it protein. The, the, to be specific, the structure is called capsid, okay? So you have two. You only label these two. That's all you need. Except for others, of course, you have a bacterial phage, you have other structures like a tail and so on. But definitely the basic uh, structure of the virus is just the DNA material, uh, sorry, the genetic material and capsid. Okay? The shape can be different. Some of them are circular. Some of them are like a rod shape. So it's different. We'll see the examples later. So you need to label your nucleic material and the capsid, which gives protection to the virus. Okay, the nuclear material can be either DNA or RNA. Okay, but not having both. So it exhibits or shows characteristic of living thing and also non-living thing, right? So you see, what is the uh, characteristic of living thing? Eh? It has nuclear acid. Uh, it can reproduce, but only in the host, only when it attack a living cell. When it's on its own outside without attacking a cell, without inside a cell, when it's not in a living cell, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't reproduce. Okay, then the next one. What is the characteristics of the non-living things? Okay, so what are the things that show that it's not alive? It does not carry out any metabolism. Metabolism That means they do not respire. They do not digest their food. Okay, they do not feed. They don't even eat to, need to eat. Okay, they don't excrete. Okay, and they're making crystallize. They can be crystal, that means they can form crystals like salt, and they can stay like that forever. Okay, no signs of life. 
So that is why it's so peculiar about the virus. They exhibit characteristics of living things and also not living things. Okay, but they put under microorganisms because they are small. That's why they still qualify under microorganisms because they are very small. Okay, they cannot be placed in any kingdom because it doesn't show characteristics of living things. So we just put it aside. Lah. We never put it into our one of our six kingdoms. Lah. Okay, those six kingdoms are only for living things. Definitely with uh, showing signs of life. So this one doesn't show signs of life if it's on its own uh, outside a cell. Okay, how small is it? Now, this one you don't use uh, micro, you know, use nano, you know. nano is even smaller. Micro is one times 10 to the power negative 6 of a meter, this is micro. Okay, if nano is one times 10 to the power negative 9 micro uh, meter, no, for meter, okay. So this is 1 nm, 1 nm is this, this 1 micrometer is this. See, see, even smaller. So how do you, let, let me put it in perspective, in your 1 mm, which is your ruler, right, 1 mm, you can fit side by side, huh? virus, huh? 2,500 up to 50,000 side by side in your small little space of 1 mm. Can you imagine that? Okay, <laughs> definitely we cannot see it. Huh? We can't even imagine it. Actually, I cannot even imagine, okay? Okay, so all viruses are parasitic eh? and they cause diseases. That's why we don't like it. <laughs> we hate virus. Okay, so what are the forms or the shapes? Okay, so some are very specific shape. They are very geometrical shapes. For example, first one, let's look at it. We call it bacterial fudge, T4. Now, this one is tadpole shape. It has a head, it has a neck, and you have got six, you know, like uh, these legs like that, right? And they uh, attack actually bacteria. It doesn't attack human cells. Okay, they attack bacteria. So, second one, spheric, uh, spherical, just like a round ball. Okay, these are example like the AIDS virus that causes... Uh, the HIV virus, which causes AIDS. Another one is your coronavirus. Ah. Uh, remember, coronavirus that causes our this uh, COVID-19 and all that. And also SARS and MERS and all that. There are many different types of viruses in the round shape. Influenza also, the one that causes flu, also is spherical in shape. Looks very similar to this. Rock shape, some are long shape. And uh, this is called the tobacco mosaic virus. So they attack tobacco plant. Tobacco plant is a plant that you use to make cigarette, okay, the down of tobacco. So they attack the plant and it causes a lot of pattern on it. You get mosaic. So it, it sort of like attacks the plant, huh? okay? And other geometrical shapes, like you can see, oh, this is a polio virus. So many different shapes. So they're more like geometrical, okay? And how are they able to reproduce? Uh, they only reproduce uh, only uh, when they're able to infect a living cell. So that's why they always like to infect because they want to pass on the generation. They want to multiply themselves. So there are viruses. They're always looking for a host, looking for a host so that they can reproduce. Okay. So how is it reproduced? Let's look at an example of the bacterial fudge. This one. This is the one that, uh, what do you call that, attacks bacteria. So look at this bacteria. This is a bacillus. How do we know bacillus? Because of the shape. It's a long shape. Okay. This is rock shape. So this is a bacillus, and you see one virus happens to latch on. It's hooked onto the bacteria, and what it does is it injects, like, like you know, suntik ah. They suntik the 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 DNA ah, the bacterial nucleic acid ah, into the host ah. So this is like a mastermind, the blueprint. Okay, this is the blueprint. This is the formula. Okay, masuk masuk inside already. Then this nucleic acid will direct the whole cell to make more viral nucleic acid. That means it controls the cell now. It's taking the material of inside the cell to command the cell to make more of itself, to copy. It copies more of the nucleic acid. It copies uh, all the things that needed to make its own cell later on. So it, inside there, multiply, 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 all right? So the cell is like, it become a zombie already. That means it's not on its own. It's not doing on its own. It's not on its. It has no control over itself already. Now the virus is controlling it. Okay, you are making copies of me. All right, so it can copy, copy, copy. After that, also you see it make all the the, the code capsid as well. You see, it make a capsid here. This is the capsid, right? The shell and all that. There's a DNA material. So everything is completed now. They assemble. So they replicate and they assemble. And now you see, you have more than one all ready to come out. So once it's all ready to come out, the cell will burst. 
of course, when the cell burst die, la, right? The bacteria is no longer there already. Habis. So the all the virus now comes out. So you get more than one now. From one, you see, you multiply for so many. So you can see viral uh, infection, the virus actually multiplies. Okay, because from one cell, you can get many. Right? So they have to infect a cell in order to continue, uh, to in order to reproduce. Okay, let's look at this. Uh, before that, any more picture to show you? Oh, yeah. This is virus. Yeah, this is virus. This is the um, influenza virus. It could be the AIDS virus as well or HIV. Okay, HIV virus. You can see all these now. They have additional cell. They have additional projections outside to latch onto the whole cell. They call it projections, protein, right? Besides the capsid, they have something additional outside to help you to latch onto the the what they call the cell, the host lah. Okay, yeah, this is bacterial phage, and this is a picture. It's not a real picture, not a real picture taken. This is also not real because not so nice, not so distinct. All right, you can't be able to see that detail. This is all computer graphics. This is also computer graphic bacterial phage. Now, but this is real. This is a real picture taken from the uh, electron microscope lah. All right, and you can see that it's very fuzzy because. It has to have high resolution. And once you go to high resolution, it becomes more fuzzy, okay? And this one, you, when you zoom in, it becomes very fuzzy. So here, this is how it happens when you have this uh, bacterial fast one to infect a cell. So it will actually inject. So you can see this base plate, it's got needles and all. So it's going to poke hole into the, the, the bacteria. And this one is going to be soon take. Uh, it's going to be injected inside. The DNA material will go into the whole cell. Okay, so here. Now you can see it latching on already, see? All right, so this is a T4 uh, bacteriophage infecting a bacillus. This is computer generated, okay? Not a real picture. All right, okay. So I think we have covered what we want to cover. Yeah, one more thing. They do not respiration, they do not respire and habitat. They are found everywhere, definitely on your table right now, okay? Virus is on your fingers, on your clothes, on your table, everywhere. And as long as they don't get into your body, it's fine. So always be hygienic. Do not uh, give them a chance to infect your body. Okay, that's why when you go out, you got to wear your mask now, eh? because you do not know who is having it, and you can ingest. Uh, you can actually absorb it into your body. All right. Okay. So we will end our class now on here, and then we will proceed on to the Google Meet afterwards for question and also exercise. Okay. So any questions here, we will discuss over in Google Meet. All right, okay, so I will end the broadcast now. I will see you later. So everyone, those who are out there, uh, thanks for watching, right, whoever you are. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in my next lesson. Probably this Saturday. I'm going to have a class this Saturday, okay, probably. So I will see you, and all right, bye-bye. Stay safe, bye-bye.